right, it is six o'clock. I will let everyone in. All right, and then I will, let's see, turn the waiting room off. So if anybody joins late, they will just pop on in. I won't have to admit them. And you should be good to go here. Um, all right. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Victoria, the Outreach Coordinator with the Alaska Airmen's Association. Um, with us today, we have Jackie, who is actually going to be taking over our Next Gen presentations. Look, we have Dylan, too. <laughs> Dylan mm -hmm. is on the Next Gen board. Hi, Dylan. Um, Oh yeah, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to unmute you? Uh, there you go. Howdy, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Good. So Dylan is also on the Next Gen board. Um, so I will be leaving the Airmen's Association, and Jackie is going to take over my role in Next Gen. She will be the new face of Next Gen for a while here, um, oh. and then we would just like to give a quick. Okay. Thank you to Wella and Melanie for this presentation, and um, yeah, we'll just let them take it from here. Sweet. All right, it's just gonna take me a second to load the presentation. One moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, you gotta turn the sound on down here. Almost there. All righty. Can you guys see the presentation okay? You see it? Okay. Yes. All right. We will go ahead. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. No one can see anybody else from the view I have. Perfect. All right. We will go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Wella. Um, I'm an aviation student at Blue River Aviation in Palmer, and I'm currently working on my IFR and AGI and IGA rating. Um, I knew I wanted to become a pilot in 2014 after my first flight in a Super Cub um, on my way to a bear hunt to Lake George. And I remember flying in the back of this plane and just thinking I'd really like to be in the front. And that was just like the ceiling deal for me. Um, but even though I had that moment in 2014, I pushed off beginning my aviation journey for six years just due to this misconception that I couldn't pursue this dream because I didn't have the funds necessary at that moment to learn how to fly. Um, and I think a lot of people do, a lot of us do that where we kind of like crush our dreams before we even start because we think something is impossible. Um, now, I know that I was wrong and there's always a way to pursue your dreams with a good plan. Today I make about a quarter of what I made back then and I have way more on my plate but I'm still able to fly. And so the point of my presentation today is to kind of share with you how I've achieved that and how you can achieve that as well. Um, my presentation is gonna be about 10 minutes long and then we're gonna move on to Melanie. So I'll keep this fairly short and we will move on to the next slide. I'd also just like to give a shout out to Jason. All these pictures that you see here is one of the students that we're flying with and he's a photographer as well. But if you're wondering about the photos. All right. I also wanted to point out that I realize everyone that's watching this presentation is in different stages of their aviation journey. Some of you might be flying, some of you may not have started flying yet, um, some of you may be mechanics. So this is just general information that we're going to go through, but not all of it may apply to you, but hopefully I cover like general spiel for everybody. Um, I'll try to keep as short as possible and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end if there are any questions throughout this presentation. So today there's some common beliefs I'd like to challenge. These are some of the beliefs that I've had and then other aviation students that I've talked to as well have had. And I'd like to challenge them. That being that flight training is paid in lump sums up front. That is the belief I had and what kept me from starting my aviation journey for six years. Um, that a private pilot's license has to cost $10,000 or more at minimum. That going into debt is the only way you can afford professional flight, flight training, so anything beyond your private pilot's license that you'd ever have to go into debt for that. And that if you don't have the funds right now, you need to delay your aviation journey. And I don't believe that, and you'll see why. 
So let's jump right into it. Um, the breakdown I'm about to show you can be applied to anything in life. It's basically just the approach that I took um, to start my aviation journey when I did not have the funds available to me. Um, let's get started. Alrighty. So the first thing I'd recommend anyone doing is to identify your goal and figure out why it is that you want to do this thing. So whether it is getting your private pilot's license, if you want to become a aviation mechanic, whatever it is you want to do, figure out what it is. And I like to write things down because that really helps me kind of structure my dreams and then figure out what your why is. Because if you don't have a why, it's very challenging to stick to your goals when things get challenging. The next thing is don't talk yourself out of your dream. I know this is something that I was guilty of. Um, I thought I couldn't pursue my aviation journey because I didn't have the funds available. And I think as adults, it's something we do a lot more this, than as children. As children, we're, we want to be astronauts, we want to be fighter pilots, whatever. Um, and then at some point in our lives, we have an adult tell us that there is logic and there are responsibilities and we can't pursue these dreams. And it's really unfortunate because you can. You can do pretty much anything you'd like to, but oftentimes we just talk ourselves out of them. So before you go crushing your own dreams, go ahead and make a plan, and I'm pretty sure it's possible. The next thing is know what it is that it takes to reach your goal. So if you have a goal in mind, so like in my situation, I'd like to become a commercial pilot, I would make a list and list everything out. What are the steps that I need to take? How long will it take for every step for these things? How much does everything cost? And I think when you put things in, per in perspective and you make a concise plan, it really helps you actively pursue that dream. The next thing is estimate your expected cost. Just because you're estimating it, it shouldn't turn you off from that dream. So when I estimate, estimated my expected cost for my flight journey was very high and kind of scary. It doesn't mean that's what you're gonna end up paying. It's just good to be prepared for what you have to tackle. And create a timeline and set a start date. And I think that is the most important part in any journey that you have, any goals that you have is setting an actual date and sticking to it and starting in some fashion. Um, because without a start date, we have no accountability. So those are the steps that I took when I felt like I had no control, I didn't have the funds available, and it allowed me to feel like I was somewhat in control of where I was going. Um, in my situation at the beginning of the year is when my aviation journey of this year started. Um, I started with ground school because that's the only thing I could afford at the time. It was $30, and that's where I was at. Um, it was the low budget option, but it made me feel like that I was working and taking a step towards my dream. Um, and once I took that first step, it's like a do domino effect started and all these other opportunities came around and were presented to me. All righty. And here's just an example of what I'm talking about when I say like line up your dreams. So on the left hand side, you see um, that's kind of my plan. I have everything listed out in my timeline, when I need to be done with my next goal. And I have it on my little vision board and then on my little binder that I have, I have my vision on there. So I'm constantly seeing it. I'm constantly being reminded of it. And when you have that in front of you all the time, you start changing how you behave. You start making flying a priority and things shift in your life to go towards your goal. All right. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So once you've created a concrete plan, it's time to determine how you will fund that plan. Um, a mindset that help, has helped me a lot is believing in abundance. This applies especially to scholarships because it's really easy to talk yourself out of applying to any scholarship. I know initially when I applied to the Alaska Airmen's Association, we had a bunch of flight scholarships and I applied for this past year. Um, and I felt very intimidated because I knew nothing about flying. I knew I wanted to fly. I didn't know how to apply. And I just kept thinking, well, there's certainly so many other people there that'll get the scholarship and there's no way they'll all get it. But um, I chose to shift my thinking and to think in a sense of abundance, like there are enough scholarships out there. Surely I will qualify for one of them at some point, maybe not this year, but maybe next year. And when you start thinking that way, um, it just encourages you to take more risks um, that could help you towards your goal. And if you think about it, someone has to get the scholarship. So I just like to think, in terms of abundance. So scholarships are one way that you can work towards funding your goals. There are also some amazing state grants and Melanie, who's the presenter after me, is going to talk about those. She's going to touch on the STEP grant, which is an amazing opportunity, both for people in aviation as well as people that are working towards 
becoming mechanics in the aviation field and have other dreams as well. Another great way to fund your flight journey is bundling lessons for a discount. And what that means is oftentimes if you start with a flight school, um, initially I was paying lesson to lesson and I realized then that if you bundle your lessons, you can get overall discounts and everything. So there's these tiny things that you can take and tiny steps that you can take to reduce your overall cost. Another thing is many of these flight schools have employment opportunities that they don't advertise. So for example, I, fl I fly with Blue River and someone has to clean the planes and someone has to fuel them, why not you? So it's a good idea to ask around and see if there are any um, opportunities, employment opportunities at your flight school and chances are there might be something out there that you can assist with. Like in my situation, I have, I'm in school full time and I'm flying full time. So I don't have a whole lot of time, but I, I get to do this on the weekends and it helps me get the planes at a reduced rate. And it also allows me to just fly at a cheaper rate overall. Another option you'd have if you're trying to figure out ways to fund your flight school is maybe you could become a ground school instructor. As you know, ground school is the foundation that we need to get any of our ratings. And it's surprising how many people aren't able to get their license because they simply never finished ground school. So getting your advanced ground, um, ground school instructor rating is not that challenging, nor is your instrument ground school instructor rating. And that's a very simple way for you to get an instructor rating overall that can then help other people around you achieve their dreams. And it also can help you for supplemental funding. So the idea in all of this is just to get really creative. And finally, get involved and volunteer. Um, the most success both myself and the peers that I fly with have had is just getting involved with your flight community. So whether that is joining the Alaska Airmen's Association or Women in Aviation, any of these clubs around here, just building those relationships opens up so many other doors in aviation that you may not be aware of. And even if you're not in a position right now to fly, having those opportunities to be around people in that environment That's opens up where you can never even imagine. That's As for lot. volunteering, it's a great idea to volunteer. Um, in my situation right now, I'm teaching Girl Scouts um, about aviation to help them get their fly girl patch. So when you're paying it forward and helping other people, you get to inspire the next generation to pursue aviation as well. And there's other things that you can do, whether it's helping with your local clubs that you're with, but paying it forward and networking that way is another wonderful way to come up on opportunities you might not be aware of. All right. We're almost at the end of my part. If you want something you've never had, you've got to do something you've never done. So taking this first step towards whether it is you, you know, beginning to fly, maybe some of you are, haven't begun your aviation journey yet, maybe some of you are trying to get your commercial rating, I'm not sure where everyone's at, but scholarships are a great way to go. And we are in the middle of scholarship season right now. So I thought I'd list a couple of them that are out there at the moment that you may be aware of. We have the Alaska Airmen's Association. Um, their scholarship season opens officially on November 1st and scholarships are due February 1st. We have the Women in Aviation Scholarships. They are due on November 10th of this year. And if you go on their website too, they have very specific descriptions of what it is that they're looking for. Oops. Sorry about that. <laughs> we had a fire alarm go off. Okay. We're back. We also have the Stripes to Bars program, which some of you may not have heard of before. If there are any veterans here or you know of any veterans, the Stripes to Bars program is a full scholarship that can get people that are veterans and recently got out of the military and are interested in aviation to go from the very beginning of their flight journey all the way to commercial pilot and beyond. And the Stripes to Bars um, scholarship opens up January 1st of every year and it's due by March 15th, but it is an amazing resource. And especially if there are any women watching this, they don't have a ton of female applicants. Um, if you do apply, your chances of getting it are fairly large because they're trying to enhance and widen their application pool. So if you're a woman, you should definitely apply. Then there's the Alaska Step Grant, which Melanie is gonna be speaking about shortly. And I'll let her elaborate on what those resources are. And we have the, this is again for, People are actively in the military right now, so not veterans, but there's something called the Army Ignited Program. And it is an amazing resource that just was recently made available to soldiers. Um, as long as they go to the education center um, at their respective base, they can get $4,000 a year to go 
towards any goal that they have that will help them after their uh, military journey. So they can get $4,000 paid towards flying if they'd like to. Um, maybe no one here is in the military, but maybe you know someone that is on active duty and you can tell them about it because it's not a widely advertised program. And finally, I know this is very abbreviated, but um, I think one thing to stick to is no one can help everyone, but everyone can help someone. So we are all in various parts of our aviation journey. And the struggle is real for all of us. Figuring out how to finance what you're doing is very challenging, but we can all help one another by sharing resources, helping with applications. There are so many different options how we can support one another, and I really believe in paying it forward and hope you do as well. And finally, I'd like to leave you with this quote. Um, like I said, I know that everyone is in different phases of their journey, but I wish you the best of luck on your way ahead. Um, I have much more that I could share about scholarships, um, about how to apply to them, about how to write, um, get a good letter of recommendation, or how to write your resume that is more aviation centric. And if anyone has any questions about that, I will stay on at the end for the questions. Or, um, I will leave you with my contact information at the end if you'd like it, and I'd be glad to help anyone with scholarship applications since we're in the middle of the season and it can make such a big difference in people's aviation journey. And that is all I got. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and pass it on to Melanie. All right, so I am not the most tech savvy person, so give me just a second here. Uh, so I'd like to thank Wella and Victoria for having me. Can everybody see the screen? Wella, is it showing up the way it's supposed to? Not yet, almost. Okay. There we go. Perfect. All right. So I'd like to thank Wella and Victoria for giving me this opportunity. Um, my name's Melanie and I work here at the Midtown Job Center with Career Support and Training Services. And what I'm gonna do, since we have so many folks on, I'm gonna go ahead and go through our orientation so that you get a general overview of exactly what it is we do. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about what is available through the Department of Labor. And so this is my opportunity to share with you where we can step in as you're going through your aviation journey and working on getting your ratings and the hours that you need. So what this will do for those of you that are going to contact us and maybe follow through in the very near future, this will kind of take care of first steps. Um, we ask everybody to participate in an orientation. And so this will serve as that orientation to our program. So if you're at a place where you think you want to interface with us, this will help uh, get you through that first step. So um, I'm just going to go through quickly and go over our mission statement, the job search support that we provide, training support, follow up, and then our programmatic guidelines so that you know kind of some of the things that we're gonna expect as you walk through our program. And at the end of the presentation, hopefully you'll understand our mission statement, the program guidelines, and the employment services that we provide. So primarily, um, we're, our mission is to strengthen and encourage Alaska's workforce and economic development by providing quality career support and training services. And we do that by administering state and federal grants. So we have the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And underneath that, there are two separate federal grants that we administer. Now, recently, we have had most of the flight schools in the Anchorage, Matsu Valley, and even Kenai take the step to become eligible for our federal grants. So that's opened it up to a broader range of individuals in terms of eligibility and the amount of money that we can provide. Um, prior to the recent past, we only had our flight schools eligible for the State Training and Employment Program or STEP grant, which is why uh, you hear the STEP program a lot. 
but we have multiple flight schools that have become eligible for federal funds, which is the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. So um, what we do through our program is workforce development. So we're focused on high growth, high demand occupations. And there's two sides to that coin. There's working with the individual who's looking at what do I want to do? What careers are high growth? Um, what is my skills gap to getting into that high growth career? And so we're assisting individuals to achieve those goals. We also have an obligation to the employers of the state of Alaska when we're developing the workforce to provide the individuals that they have shortages in, right? So if they're short on nurses and electricians, those are the things that we're focusing on training individuals to get into because those are the, the, the areas that need the most um, folks in those jobs. So through our program, we assist uh, individuals in achieving career goals by determining grant program eligibility and suitability. Eligibility is very straightforward. I'll talk about that in a few more slides. Suitability can get into a lot of gray areas. And particularly when we're talking about aviation, suitability is generally not being at the point where you have enough flight hours or you're not quite at the number of ratings that you need to have in order to qualify for employment. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So suitability would be your plan doesn't fit with our program yet. So typically when we're talking to pilots um, or people who are looking to become flight instructors, we're not saying no, we're saying not yet. Um, we assess the need for training or support services and then we look at addressing barriers to employment. I'm not going to spend any time on that. Um, typically, when people come to us, especially in the aviation industry, they already have a lot of time and money invested, and they already know what it is that's required um, by the FAA to pass uh, drug tests and all that sort of thing. So I'm not gonna spend any time on that. And then we provide referrals to partner resources. So we have a lot of different partners that we work with that also do funding. And so if it's appropriate, we would refer individuals to a partner and they also refer people our way. So um, our primary service is job search. Um, so when individuals come to us, we want them to have one employment goal. We have 90 days to help them get a job. So we look at the labor market for the occupation. We can assist with resume, cover letter, preparing applications, job search. And we also provide mock interview assistance for individuals who haven't had to interview in a while and they're a little bit shaky and they wanna prep before they go live with an employer. Um, and our job search assistance requires that you keep a job search log and also keep track of the job referrals. Um, I'm not sure if we have any um, mechanics or um, avionics techs uh, on board tonight, but support services are things that we can provide outside of training. So if an individual is uh, going to work but they need specific tools that they have to obtain or um, that the employer says, in order for us to hire you, you have to have them or as part of your employment agreement, you have to obtain them within a specific amount of time. Um, we get that a lot with uh, different companies. They'll hire people and give them 90 days to get the tools or the credentials. So um, tools are a big thing in a lot of the trades and we see that with diesel mechanics, um, aviation, the A&P mechanics. So if you are looking to go to work, we can help you get the tools required. Sometimes there's specific work gear. It may be um, car hearts and heavy work boots. If you're gonna be spending a lot of time outside, um, it might be shop overalls. It just depends on what occupation you're in. And then the specific credentials. So sometimes employers require you to get a credential within a certain period. We see that pretty commonly with class A CDLs. Um, an employer will hire somebody and say, hey, get your CDL within 90 days. Um, for training, if you're attending school full time, we can help with books, um, equipment, 
um, specific tools that are required for the training program and training related clothing. Um, for a lot of people, once they get done with training, one of the things is they start going out and applying for jobs. They don't have nice interview clothes. We can typically as assist with that as well. Um, all other support services are assessed on a needs basis. So we talk about uh, training services, um, career change by necessity versus by choice. Um, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that because like I said earlier, most of the time by the the time we get uh, pilots or people that are looking to be flight instructors, they've already invested a lot of time and a lot of money into their training. So they've already made the leap into that new career. And so they're not just stepping out of their old career. So we give a little bit of leeway to that and we work with everybody individually. So we'll be talking to each one of you individually. So we're not an entitlement program. Um, and what, I, what we mean when we say not an entitlement is if you go into a DPA office, a Department of Public Assistance office, and you apply for the SNAP benefit program, which is formerly known as food stamps, it doesn't matter how many other folks applied that day and got approved. If you're eligible, you're going to get SNAP benefits. We are grant funded, so all of our decisions are based on eligibility, suitability, and grant fund availability. So everything we do, the underpinning foundation of our entire program is to help individuals find and keep permanent full-time employment at a self-sustaining wage. So at the end of every plan that we write is employment. So for our training services, uh, it needs to result in a certification, license, diploma, or degree, and be vocationally or occupationally connected. So it has to have it. It has to be a credential that employers want to see in order for you to work in that occupation. Um, for our federal programs, or that would be the WIOA programs, training has to be completed within 104 weeks or two years, and within 52 weeks for the STEP program. We ask you to look at other sources of funding. So if you have Pell Grant availability, different scholarships, filing for unemployment, those types of things. And I'm not gonna talk about funding for self-employment. If you're interested in self-employment, you can talk to us offline about that. If we are funding training services, we need you to be able to support yourselves while you're in school or training. So we have everybody do a financial assessment so you got to show us how you're going to cover housing, childcare, anything that you're monthly obligated to pay needs to be accounted for on, our, on a financial assessment. Um, typically, we can fund the training piece, but if you're looking at several months to a year, possibly a year and a half of training, we need to know that you're not going to end up getting evicted or getting into a worse situation because we're sending you to training. Um, for our federal programs, once you finish your training, you get a job, we put you in a follow-up and you're in follow-up for an entire year. Um, so we can assist with additional employment services and it helps us maintain accurate performance measures for our programs. So I'm just going to click through our program guidelines uh, really quickly. So for all of our programs, you need to be 18 or older. Veterans always receive a priority of service. So Typically, if we have $5,000 left and we have a veteran and a non-veteran applying for services, the veteran's going to get preference for that funding. Um, I just said uh, financial assessments will be done on each individual. It's just a two-page Excel um, sheet. It's pretty easy. And funding is always determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so we look at your individual needs. Everybody comes to us with different work histories, different education backgrounds, different family situations, different resources. So we look at you as an individual. We don't do cookie cutter stuff. And so um, sometimes we have people say, well, my cousin Frank came in and got X, but your cousin Frank's situation might not be exactly like your situation. So we're gonna treat you as an individual and look at your specific situation. So plans do look different for different people. Um, 
For our federal programs, you need to be eligible to work in the United States. And if you're a male born after December 31st, 1959, you must have registered for selective service if you were required to do so. And I mentioned earlier that most of the flight schools um, have taken the step to become eligible for federal funds and the eligible training provider list is the list that has all of the training vendors that are eligible for our federal grants. And so we have pretty much all of the major flight schools um, are on the list at this point. If you want um, these links, I don't know if you're able to write them down or at the end, my email address will be available and I can provide you with any information that you'd like uh, to be refreshed on. For our state program, you must have been an Alaskan resident for at least 30 days and paid into unemployment insurance within the last five years. And all of our training vendors for flight schools are um, on the eligible, I'm sorry, the Commission on Post-Secondary Education approved list. Um, and some that aren't on the ETPL do have a standing with the ACPE, which is the first step. So even if they're not eligible for federal funds, they would be eligible for state funds because they do have a standing on the Alaska Commission on Post-Secondary Education um, training site. So one of the things that's important with our program is that you maintain monthly contact with your case manager during assessment, during training, during job search, and for that one year in follow-up after um, for our federal programs. If people just disappear on us, um, we can terminate services and that will potentially affect eligibility for future services. So we just ask that you follow through and maintain contact with us. Um, and we do that by using Sarah and she's just a virtual assistant. It's a program that we enroll folks in once they're um, in a plan status with us. And so for most people, stopping answering emails or getting phone calls during the day is not really um, it's not real convenient and so Sarah will text you and if you don't have text capability she'll email you so during training job search follow-up you'll just get um, monthly check-ins from Sarah and we give you a sheet so that you know what to expect so you know it's not some sort of scammy weird thing coming over your phone so you get all the information about what it's going to look like. So um, here, here at orientation, and if you are interested in following through, my contact information will be at the end. Um, and then you'll, you can make contact with us. We'll send you a two-page form, and you'll get assigned a case manager after you send that form back to us filled out. And then your case manager will do a pre-assessment and complete a to-do list. And then we get into developing your unique plan. So looking at where you're at in your career goals, your overall stability and job readiness, kind of figuring out um, what services you actually need and then writing your individual employment plan, which is what leads to funding assistance for job search or training, depending on what you're doing. And at the end, what we're looking for is employment stability and retention. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over the to-do list because we're not quite there yet, but I will say that everything that we um, ask people to provide us, so all plans are very individualized, but we do ask everybody to provide us with an updated Word resume, do some labor market research, which is really important. Um, the labor market tells you what that occupation is doing over a 10-year period. So it'll talk about employment and outlook and the wages in that occupation. We also ask folks to provide three current job listings in the desired occupation. So if you're looking to be a pilot, three job openings for pilots or um, for CFIs, um, if you're a wanting to be a mechanic, um, some mechanic jobs, and then information on the training facilities. It's really important for us that uh, potential participants make informed decisions about their training vendors. So we want you to look at everybody that does that training and then based on your individualized criteria, um, whether it's you know the type of plane or training availability dates, whatever it might be, 
um, doing your research and looking at all possible training vendors before you make a decision. So full-time permanent employment in a high growth, high demand career field is our program goal. It's the primary thing that we focus on. So going back to what I said at the beginning, for most people in aviation, we really understand that by the time you're able to go and get your first job as a pilot, you've already um, you've already invested a lot of time and a lot of money. And so if you're not quite at that point, we're not going to say no, we're going to say not yet. You're not quite at the point where you'll be ready for us because any credential that we assist somebody to obtain has to be the one that gets them their first job in, the, in that field. And it's really key for aviation. So, um, it's gotten weird with this pandemic year. And so there's, we've been getting some unusual scenarios and some different requests. And so we're evaluating everything as it comes in. Um, so if you have a situation that you want to talk to one of us about, definitely give us a call. Um, we're happy to answer any questions or go over any scenario that you have. So that's pretty much what I have. Um, all of us right now are located here at the Midtown Job Center and our main phone number is 269-0088. That'll get you the case manager of the day. So we always have somebody on deck to answer that phone and answer any questions that come in, but you're also welcome to call me anytime. My direct number is 269-2022 and my email address is also up on the screen if you wanna send me a direct email. So I'll just leave that up for a second just to give everybody uh, a second to get that written down or take a screenshot, whatever you're doing. Okay, so that's pretty much all I have. Okay, great. Well, um, so we do have the chat feature enabled if anybody has any questions that they wanna use the chat for. Um, otherwise, if people have questions, you can unmute yourself. We just wanna make sure nobody's trying to talk over each other. Um, so, just um, go ahead, you can unmute yourself if you want um, or use the chat feature and then we can try to go from there. But yeah, if there's any questions to start out. Otherwise, I think we're, we're about done. Questions going once, going twice. All right, well, I guess we will go ahead and wrap up for tonight. I would like to thank Melanie and Wella for doing this presentation for us. It was a lot of really great information. Um, hopefully everybody was able to take something positive away from this. And if you missed something, we do have it recorded and we'll be putting it on our YouTube channel. Um, so you should be able to find it there and we'll probably send a link out once we have that done, all of our members, so they know it's done. Um, but yeah, thank you, Melanie and Wella for this awesome presentation. Thanks for having us. Yeah. And Rachel also says thank you in the chat. So <laughs> yeah. Um, and if anybody needs... Um, some contact informa information for Melanie or Wella. Um, you can also reach out to myself or Jackie uh, through the Airmen's Association, and we can also pass that along if you missed it or if you need their email addresses. We will be happy to pass that along as well. 
All right. Well, if there's nothing else, I think we can all sign off and have a great night.